Dear friends, uh, I have a pleasure to introduce you a very distinguished guests in the first panel. First and, for, uh, and first we have our, uh, our my dear colleague Heli Tir Maklar, who is the ambassador at large for cyber diplomacy in the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Also alive from Tallinn uh, is Miss Regine uh, Krienberger, Ambassador for Cyber Foreign Policy from the Federal uh, Office, uh, Federal Foreign Office of Germany. And our third guest is joining us online. It's Mr. Pascal Stechen, CEO of Security Made in Luxembourg. So to kick off with this uh, strategic discussion, very happy to have you here. Very happy to see you all also in a way that uh, uh, we don't have to just connect online, but, uh, but there is also some live presence. So um, maybe to, to start with a bit more wider discussion, um, I would ask from you, Heli, uh, why cybersecurity is becoming so relevant uh, in the international community? I know that Estonia has been, I mean, in the, European, in the UN Security Council for the last um, half a year. I mean, there uh, have been a, quite a number of activities ongoing at the EU level. So could you illustrate a bit, I mean, what is exactly behind uh, the scenes and, and what exactly is the reason why cyber is so important now? Well, cybersecurity comes together with increasing digitalization, and, and digitalization for Estonians, uh, of course, is something uh, as ear. So we have been uh, digitalized some two, two decades already, and, and since we are also prepared for um, the dark side of the digitalization, which is cyber attacks, cyber operations, uh, cyber crime, and, uh, and other attempts to uh, intrude our information systems. Well, when all our everyday activities move online and the data is much more important and the protection of the personal data in the networks is much more important, so it means that um, in all walks of life we have to pay attention to cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity uh, has been also, of course, surfacing to the foreign policy um, arena because of the uh, new technology's role in conflicts. All the modern conflicts we have seen in the past 10 years have some cyber component there. Um, so the diplomats uh, are now talking increasingly about um, other new technologies and not just um, cyber attacks uh, when it comes to the uh, foreign and, and security policy of countries. But of course, we also are affected by cybersecurity because of the resilience issues of all our critical infrastructure and other organizations. Whether we work in the ministry or university or somewhere in the private sector, the resilience of the information networks that we are using is adamant. And, uh, and this kind of cybersecurity work from the technical perspective is um, something that majority of our European nations are facing. Uh, of course, if the law enforcement um, specialists would be here, they would be telling you that um, it is important to make sure that criminality that has moved to cyberspace uh, will be addressed also. Uh, and, um, and all the cybercrime issues, uh, what we have seen also before the COVID, but uh, uh, we know that cybercrime has increased during the COVID, um, they, this needs to be addressed. Um, I have to say that the European Union uh, is dealing with all these aspects which I just outlined. So we have a pretty uh, solid European Union posture on cybersecurity since 2013 EU first cyber strategy. So we have the um, um, internal market components there with the NIS directive um, uh, adopted in 2016. Um, we have the Cybersecurity Act in 2017, which is uh, prescribing the new certification system for um, all the IT products from the perspective of cybersecurity. Uh, we also have now um, the additional resources coming in to the field of digitalization and cyber with the new MFF. 
and um, uh, and for even longer time we have had um, harmonized European um, um, laws and regulations to fight cybercrime. We have three directives now, or four, or four directives to fight cybercrime. Um, most prominently, maybe the directive on attacks against information system, which was adopted already in 2013. And the e-evidence directive uh, is, is also very important for the law enforcement. Uh, as for the foreign and security policy, uh, we have um, uh, adopted several uh, important documents in this field and the uh, foreign and security policy has been uh, in a prominent place in 2013 strategy onwards in the European Union. And uh, maybe very importantly, we have the cyber diplomacy response framework um, agreed between the member states where we are um, making sure that um, cyber attacks and cyber operations that we face are not going unpunished and unnoticed. And, and we do um, declarations, statements, and we also already have adopted two sets of sanctions uh, in order to respond to cyber operations and malicious cyber activities that are um, uh, uh, addressed against the European uh, Union member states and some of our partners. And of course, very importantly, uh, uh, the capacity building outside the uh, European Union in the third countries has been in the focus of the European cyber uh, policy for a long time. European Union has been one of the largest donors when it comes to cyber capacity building, and uh, especially in fighting um, cyber crime, uh, the projects Classy and Classy Plus, together with Council of Europe, have been uh, very prominent in this field, uh, uh, promoting the Budapest Convention and the rule of law in cyberspace outside of the European Union. Uh, with the cybernet, we hope to have um, the uh, qualitative jump uh, in order to collect together the different experts from the different EU member states that would be able to um, go outside and, and help the uh, cyber experts in third countries. Because what we lack uh, in most of our countries, not just in the European Union, but also outside, is the expertise and the competent experts, competent specialists who could help to secure our cyber networks. Uh, you ask also about the UN and UN Security Council. Um, <clears throat> Estonia has been uh, uh, in the UN Security Council since the beginning of this year, and we have been raising the issue of cyber security there. Of course, the United Nations also has been working on cyber issues uh, already um, for a longer time. So we have um, uh, the 2010, 2013 and 2015 group of governmental experts reports that um, are forming the basis of our activities when it comes to state behavior in cyberspace. So we have um, agreed on the norms of uh, uh, responsible state behavior. We have agreed that international law applies in cyberspace, that uh, uh, confidence building measures and capacity building measures should be taken by different countries. Uh, and um, what we do in the Security Council now is we raise awareness even further and at a higher level on cyber issues. We raised also certain cyber attacks in March uh, specifically, and it was the first time that the uh, Security Council addressed cyber issues officially. And we also have uh, organized awareness raising events um, uh, in the margins of the Security Council. But in addition to the UN and EU, I also have to uh, maybe uh, say a few words about the role of other regional organizations in cybersecurity and our partners in the wider world. Because we see the regional organizations as hubs for knowledge, uh, dissemination of best practices and information exchange. Uh, and, and our partnership is the um, Organization of American States, ASEAN, African Union and some others is very important here when we talk about the um, capacity building outside of the European Union. So I think um, we have to force those global partnerships and make sure that uh, uh, we also um, uh, have a very close uh, uh, best practices exchange with them in order to understand what kind of requirements our partners have and, and make sure that our capacity building efforts will be efficient. Yeah, just following up from here, I mean, uh, you touched, I think, the essence of the, of the EU cybernet as well. Um, I mean, question to you, Regina. How, do you feel that the um, EU is doing enough in the field of cybersecurity? And do we have a proper understanding of the needs of third countries, the re relevant caps and, and the expectations to our expertise? Mm, well, I would say 
<coughs> I'm coming from the foreign ministry, and per perhaps uh, Pascal will then later uh, elaborate a little bit more on the technical aspects. But for the political side, we have to um, we have an internal dimension of the European Union, which Haley mentioned already. But um, internal dimension means what about our own cybersecurity, the cybersecurity of our own government services and European services to the citizens. Um, citizens expect. Uh, from governments to make sure that um, the access to an open and free and undivided uh, internet is also secure. So we have to deliver on that. And uh, this is um, also uh, a task of the Commission. Uh, we have already um, a directive on a network information security, which has to be uh, reviewed because of the technological changes that have taken place. And we expect this uh, review and update this year just to discuss it uh, uh, among member states and with the commission uh, then um, uh, later. Then on the external dimension, and this is very important, and I want to highlight it, that cyberspace is uh, undivided. It has no borders. So internal and external dimension are closely interlinked. We cannot make sure that we as European citizens have uh, access to um, a secure access to internet if we um, if we do not uh, support our partners in third countries to make sure that they have also established some basic rules of cyber security and cyber security in this definition is not only the technological side uh, of the coin but also the legal and political side of the coin the framework that we are establishing together with the technology and this is where we have uh, to do more. Um, the EU will spend in the next uh, multi-annual financial framework a lot of money for digitalization, both inside the EU and outside. And we, m we have to make sure that with this, uh, let's say, new wave of digitalization comes also a new wave of cybersecurity. So this is why I would say, yes, we definitely have to do more inside, but also outside, uh, outside the European Union. As for the gaps, perhaps in third countries, uh, this is um, a topic for our discussions, member states' discussions, and also European uh, Commission and uh, external action services discussions with these countries. Because um, it's not one size fits all, and we have to make sure that our experts really recognize the needs in they are in place in the capitals or in the regions where they're going to. So um, this will be a very important work also for the experts of the EU cybernet to, um, to get to a proper understanding what is the need. Yes, I, I, I think it's a very well put. I mean, just from the practical angle, Pascal, maybe you could, I mean, say a few words, I mean, about the uh, future perspective of EU cooperation in, in, in third countries and, and how do we, how could we better understand the needs of, of third countries and how to spend the money that will be allocated in, in the next financial framework wisely enough that it would really have an impact on the ground? Uh, thank you. I, um, I hope that um, I can, I would say, give a few elements about this question because uh, clearly I don't have a, a complete answer that would be uh, that would be too uh, um, uh, that would be a real, uh, I would say, um, uh, bullet or, or, or glass glass ball looking into the future. Um, just to add on what has been said, the, uh, the EU is indeed investing or will be investing a lot in cybersecurity in the near future with this, the new Digital Europe, Horizon Europe programs. And all this expertise, all these new developments is a, good, a very good basis also for capacity building in the um, development countries or in third, uh, third countries. So that, that's, that's, I would say, first basis to have internal European real expertise and to, to continue to develop this. That's, that's a clear um, first step. Um, combined with this, as you probably know, there is also a new regulation in the process of being uh, uh, discussed and, and, and decided very, very uh, timely, shortly, which is about the European Cybersecurity Competence Center, which will really 
be the entity that is working on this harmonization, on this coordination of all these investments, of all this um, expertise that is being developed in the in the next future. So I think that this center will play a role or will in, at least uh, um, bring in some real interesting synergies with the different cyber specific cyber capacity building initiatives, like for instance, the EU CyberNet project. And there was a, a, clear, a clear need for synergies, uh, I think. About, uh, more about the needs or the gaps or, or the um, kind of expectations, uh, maybe a few examples from other initiatives or other projects that we were involved in. So Luxembourg, as you, as you know, is, is, is quite a huge financial hub. And um, so the investments or the cooperation development support that, that we do as Luxembourg is a lot in this area of financial of the financial sector. Um, this, and since three or four years now, cybersecurity has become one of the elements of this support. And we were involved in, in one of the other projects. One example is, and together with the IMF, the International Money Fund, uh, we had uh, been supporting the Central Bank of Kyrgyzstan to do some risk management governance processes, but also to understand and help them identify how they could set up search. So computer security incident response response teams, which is one of the cornerstones of the NIST directive in Europe, is a clear need to help third countries also develop capacities for these kind of um, services, because that's where, that's a key, that's a very important element, which will help to reduce or to fight cybercrime. Another, another example, which uh, highlights a bit maybe the, uh, the, the needs or, or the, the clear elements that, that where, where we see it would be important to continue the development is a project that we are currently working on. This together with, has been developed together with the CGAP, which is the think tank of the World Bank. Uh, it is called African Cybersecurity Resource Center, specific for the financial inclusion area. So micro, microfinance institutes and all these uh, establishment in the financial area, which in Africa are, I would say, very small entities um, with all these very small credits, and still they have a huge need of cyber security. And there, this resource center um, will develop really all, I would say, the full spectrum of needs in cyber security, from awareness raising, training, education and research, so together with uh, universities, local and, and from Luxembourg, the idea is to develop master's programs and PhD candidates, up to more operational things like uh, certs, as I mentioned already, or security operations centers, together with local local entities from, from uh, the sub-Saharan African region, to uh, involves them into a so-called ISAC, so an information sharing and analysis community. So I think that that's an, an important thing that all the, the I would say the infrastructure, the, the, the mechanisms, the systems that we have set, in, set up in, in Europe and in other places in the world clearly find a, a need. I would say my, my, my knowledge is mainly Africa, but clearly there is an, as a need. And what we saw is that um, targeting a specific sector makes a lot of sense, uh, and especially the financial sector, because sorry, there is sorry, where Pascal, the need for, for intervening here at the moment. Before we go to a sectors, because we, we probably will cover it anyway. Okay. I just wanted to ask from Heli and Regina as well. I mean, there is a number of actors uh, currently uh, providing capacity building um, outside Europe been borders. I mean, we have our own different uh, uh, entities, but there are also UN projects. There are a lot of international projects ongoing. How to ensure a kind of a proper coordination for the EU uh, uh, projects and how to ensure that we really make the maximum out of the investments that we are going to make? Because there are a long list of projects that currently are, are, are implemented, but 
I, I think that there is a little bit of lack of coordination there. So, I mean, maybe Heli, you could, you could elaborate a little on that. I think we, we, uh, we have to coordinate a bit more, yes, um, also ins inside of the European Union, and I hope that the cybernet can be of help there. Uh, of course, we have to do it together with the, um, uh, other partners in uh, Brussels and in the capitals, and uh, uh, we also have to coordinate with the global partners. We know that the World Bank has uh, plans to set up the new trust fund for cybersecurity, there is the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise, uh, which the Dutch government has set up, uh, which is now the independent global body. Uh, so, and there are some <coughs> other regional um, organizations which have their own cyber capacity building efforts. So I think um, this kind of uh, donor coordination is absolutely vital here because uh, we uh, make, should make sure that we do not duplicate what we are going to do. Yes. So. Mm. I think uh, I, would, I would call for all the experts to um, coordinate more and maybe also to s call for the European Commission uh, to set up some sort of more formal coordination in Europe at least. Uh, question to you, Regina. I mean, could EU cybernet serve this purpose? Uh, I mean, German Federal uh, Office uh, is also uh, a partner in the EU cybernet uh, project an active contributor there. Um, what are your expectations to, uh, to this format? And uh, do you see that this could be the one-stop shop where all the third countries might be turning in the future, asking for assistance and, and um, expertise from Europe? Definitely. I, I would say that um, there is a lack of cyber experts everywhere, inside the EU and in third countries. So uh, EU Cybernet as the platform to collect information about experts that are available, about their skill sets, um, and also um, the capacity of the Cybernet to train the trainers, it will be really helpful to, uh, to also to uh, contribute to coordination. Because um, it, there will be one point where to turn to if you're looking for a cyber expert. And um, th this will be helpful. I would like to add for, for um, coordination uh, one more general view. Um, and that is, of course, uh, there are many object, um, uh, projects ongoing. And we need more coordination. But in the end, there will be also a competition of models of how to uh, implement both uh, digitalization projects and cybersecurity projects a competition of models and we as the European Union should be proactive in promoting our European model of how to deal with these issues. And that's why I think that we um, really need to be more efficient and therefore to coordinate better among member states and within the Commission services and within the ex European External Action Service to be in place where we are needed. Yes, um, Pascal, back to you. I mean, you mentioned earlier the European Union Cybersecurity Center that is um, something that will be, or competence center that will be set up soon and the discussions are underway. Um, how do you see the relationship between the uh, EU cybernet and the future competence center? My understanding so far has been that EU competence center is mostly uh, with the orientation to our internal uh, business and our internal capacity building, but EU cybernet is covering the, the area which is outside of the EU borders. But uh, how, how do you see that uh, relationship? Yes, exactly. It's clearly that the new competence center is is focused internally, so it's, it's focused uh, uh, inside on on the EU. But the, I would say, if you if we want to uh, bring our the EU expertise out to the world outside, well, we have to build up it internally first, and then uh, bring it uh, or then help other other third countries to to develop. So I clear, I see a clear uh, transfer link in there. So that EU Cybernet could profit from the development of the competence center or of all the activities that the competence center will coordinate. And if from the beginning on there is a close collaboration, then this can be, I would say, globally um, planned and, and uh, with a common strategy to develop or to, to fine tune the different developments that also can not only help locally Europe, but also can help 
and address foreign policy uh, challenges. So that, that's where I see really the, the link between these both uh, projects or entities. Okay, thanks for that. I mean, Pascal already mentioned it earlier as well. Um, Regina, how, how do you feel? I mean, in order to make a maximum out of the, 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 the financial investments that we are making and the expertise that we are exporting, um, which should be the priority regions? Um, Europe probably cannot help the rest of the world, I mean, in, in entirety, but is there some political point of view? I mean, is there any, any priority actions or, or regions where we should focus uh, uh, in the beginning? Or, or how do you see this from the, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs point of view? Um, well, geographical distance doesn't necessarily be, uh, play the most important role because uh, Cyberspace, as I, I was mentioning already, is um, is a space without borders and doesn't necessarily respect a geographical distance. So we have to approach it from a different point of view. But um, as for priorities, I would say that our neighborhood is the first uh, area where we should uh, concentrate our energy uh, because um, on the political level, these countries are expecting more um, EU engagement with them. So uh, the EU neighborhood, both in the east as in the south, is uh, certainly the first, um, the first area where we should focus on. And then um, after that, um, I think it, is, it should be part of the EU-Africa um, uh, activities. The, the, in 2025, 75% of the internet users will be in the global south. And a lot of them will be in Africa. They will jump from no technology to smartphone technology in no time. So this is, uh, this is an area where we find um, the internet users of the future. And it's also a continent which is um, within the context of multilateralism, a decisive uh, continent, very uh, decisive in the in the question of can we maintain a multilateral order and um, digitalization and following that cybersecurity is a one core element of, of the partnership in this in this field. Very, very well elaborated. I mean, I, just from the practitioner's point of view, when I was serving as a deputy director responsible for cyber issues in the Estonian Mini, uh, Information System Authority, uh, we were also participating of a couple of uh, capacity building projects. And I would say that uh, mm, despite uh, our regional preferences, the most relevant element for the success of different projects seemed to be the political engagement in mm -hmm. respective country. I mean, if you had a kind of a solid relationship with the political and strategic level, then the success of the project was, 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 was more or less granted. But there were several options where we had a, like, a very like-minded country, but unfortunately, I mean, not much happened because it all remained at the technical level. Mm. What is your feeling, I mean, Heli, about that? I mean, where should Europe focus? I mean... You are very much right that uh, buy-in from the political level uh, is very important and, and we have to make sure that uh, when we are doing this future European Union projects that we are uh, tackling not just a technical layer but also the um, uh, higher uh, policy, policy makers uh, in the government. Uh, this is one op um, obstacle to the capacity building that uh, we are not operating at the right layer. layer. Um, another obstacle is uh, sustainability. We know already from other fields uh, of capacity building that um, quite often in many developing countries it is not easy to retain expertise. Even if we train a certain number of people during a certain uh, uh, project, so the question is how this country is able to sustain this progress later mm. on. And it is uh, still a challenge, I think, in other fields, uh, especially when it comes to security, uh, how this expertise later on, once our projects in Africa or wherever will be finished, how the sustainability of the effort will be granted. I think we as the international community have to tackle that all together in the future.
Mm-hmm. I think a good colleague of mine uh, from Netherlands explained this in very colorful manner, uh, the sustainability of the, uh, some of the capacity building projects, that where they went uh, and started with the proper training of uh, local CERT, and in the end, I mean, all these people were hired a year later for the private sector because, I mean, they were properly trained, they had a very good know-how on the cybersecurity setup and relevant uh, practicality. So it was a little bit like uh, an everlasting story. So, um, I mean, Pascal, coming to you, I, if, if I would ask, I mean, from the practitioner's point of view and, and, and with a person who has experience with different projects, um, what would be the priority actions that might be needed in, in different countries? I mean, where should uh, the EU cybernet focus or where should the partners of EU cybernet focus when they are conducting projects? That de- really depends on, on the country because uh, the, there are diff- very, very different maturity levels in terms of cyber security in, in, in different countries. So it, it's it's not always uh, easy to to say where where to start. Um, when we look at when I when I look at at this project I mentioned before, we have in in, in sub-Saharan Africa. There, clearly, the idea is, and this is related to the sustainability question before, is to as much as possible create local activities. Uh, so and not only on the and specifically uh, not only in I would say public areas or, or public entity activities, but in the private sector. So um, helping develop local companies in the area of cybersecurity so that I would say there is also a market-driven approach. And I think that that's an important element for, for, this, for the sustainability aspect as well, to, to be able to, um, that there is not someone goes there, the expertise is given and it goes away again. So that's, it, it continues with a, with an activity, and and activity needs needs a market needs needs services that can be can be sold can be can be bought. So there needs to be an, an offer and demand, uh, I would say, approach uh, with this uh, with this project. And um, there clearly it is where the where the need is in the in the area of financial inclusion. For instance, we see a very clear need for I would say operational security. So. Fighting fighting cyber crime because there is a lot of of fraud going on in 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 this area as 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 we know, uh, which I would say is 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 clear because that's where the what's where, where the money is. So really focus on on the on the key on the key problems. Bring in some I would say key experts. Develop the local competences and continue to support these competences. Maybe a few years after it can run run by itself. So that's really really our approach. So this African Resource Center I was mentioning will be an entity in Africa itself. So um, this the, the idea is that, uh, in fact, we created last week a, an, uh, a company in, in Senegal that will become this, uh, this resource center. Yes, well, f- f- thanks for that. I, I just wanted to highlight that I, I guess that here a very important role is also country-specific profiles, uh, that we have a proper mapping and understanding what are the projects that are conducted already in respective third countries, who are the main actors there, and what are the specific needs. So I think here the EU, EU cybernet might have a very important role to play as well. But uh, Regina, you mentioned um, neighborhood and um, probably as one of the priorities that we should um, invest to, to our close to our borders. I mean, um, how should we do that and whether um, um, it is politically feasible? I mean, let's draw an example. Uh, if there would be a case that in Belarus there would be elections, uh, fair elections to be organized at any chance, would EU Cybernet or, or, or any of its partners should be viable for, for providing support for this in order to ensure that, I mean, the cybersecurity of the elections would be provided. A similar project, I remember, was conducted in, in Ukraine f- uh, a few years ago. Um, it was more about the fake news and the, the information campaigns. But do you see that EU Cybernet could, could play a role there as well to our neighbors very close to, to our borders? Um, 
that's why I said let's not only focus on the technological skill set that these countries might need, but let's um, hold hold to the whole European model and and see that we can keep it together. So not only technology and skills, but also uh, the legal framework and the um, the, the law enforcement side, what you mentioned, and so the, the, the cooperation that comes with it. And in, uh, in a hypothetical case uh, in Belarus, of course, we, from coming from this political considerations, we could also uh, discuss how we can be useful in, in, in these terms. Yeah. Heli, what would be your number one country where to go with the, with the cyber capacity building mission? <clears throat> well, number one countries, I think, uh, uh, are, are those countries where the digitalization has rapidly taken place uh, during the recent years, and there are no cybersecurity safeguards in place whatsoever. So I think these, it's not one country, there are plenty of countries like this, because what has happened in, in different parts of the, of the world is that Digitalization and the rapid um, use of ICT is driven also by the market forces and by the companies. So you have telecommunications companies and some other ISPs, some other companies operating and, and they are not operating uh, without the profits. But since no one is there to demand cybersecurity and if in those countries and those uh, territories uh, are no laws and regulations and requirements for cybersecurity in place, then they could easily become safe heavens for cyber criminals and uh, other groups, proxy actors for some nation states and so on. So we have to make sure that uh, all the countries in all regions have a minimum um, legal framework to address cybercrime, to investigate, prosecute cybercrime, and also to have incident response capacity both technical and organizational and some sort of public-private partnership in place on the resilience side. So I think uh, this is... Okay, but I'm asking, asking from a bit more political angle, what would be the countries that you would advise us not to go for? I mean, uh, should we focus on like-minded <laughs> countries perhaps? With similar values, similar understanding yeah. of democracy, this human is, rights? I think uh, where, interestingly where Estonia has been receiving most of the requests recently is Latin America. Uh, in addition, of course, to our Eastern partners with whom we have been working for 10 years or more in cybersecurity, we have now uh, more and more friends in Latin America because they are in this phase of r rapid digitalization and they are um, now building up their own uh, cybersecurity strategies and cybersecurity capacities and they are coming and asking our assistance, for instance. Pascal, maybe you can add a few words about your experience also with the African countries and then we can turn to our audience as well for, for a few questions because we indeed have a live audience here during this conference. So, Pascal. Yes, thank you. Um, one, one, one key element which was mentioned by, by Heli is the public-private uh, partnership. So, it, it's absolutely clear that all initiatives, all efforts in uh, capacity building should have this public and private uh, uh, element to make sure on one side what Ali mentioned that I would say the things the companies the the, the I would say pure commercial activities that are that are uh, ongoing are not going in in the wrong direction um, are framed with some um, I would say uh, laws and 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 and, and and clear ethical frameworks around cyber security. Uh, that's an, that's that's an important an important part. But it should also not be only, I would say, focusing on on this framework. It is all there is always a need also for an, to develop the commercial activity. So that's that's for me really definitely clear. And that's how um, what is our approach in in Africa. So we as as a uh, public agency, as the cybersecurity agency here of the Ministry of Economy in Luxembourg. We obviously have a close link with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, in this project in Africa, we also have a partner, a, public, um, a private company partner, which is part of the project. So that's really this public-private partnership that we are looking for and that we are uh, addressing. And we see that um, 
focusing on on uh, on this sector the dimension on the financial uh, financial sector it's really it's really interesting because there the 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 um uh the requirements or the the, the views are very are very close from the private as well as the public side because they all want to develop this this activity they know that a good financial sector will help develop the country and so this is this was for us a very interesting angle to start this collaboration activities. Well, thanks. I, I would like to take the opportunity now to, to turn to our audience, uh, which is a rare occasion nowadays. So uh, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand and, and uh, also introduce yourself and uh, where are you from and, and please. Any volunteers? I see on the second road. Yeah, please. Thank you very much for sharing this inf um, interesting views. I'm Anna Vishna from the European External Action Service. And uh, you already very shortly addressed uh, whether the EU is doing enough. Um, the European Union has started to work on the new cybersecurity strategy. Uh, I would like to hear your views. Uh, what would be the most important elements to address in the new strategy from the capacity building perspective? Thank you. Thank you. I, I think let's take maybe one more question from the audience as well, and then we can proceed with the, with the, with the answers. Yes, I see a gentleman then in the background. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for all the panelists. Uh, my name is Christopher and I'm working in the Foreign Ministry of, uh, of Estonia and collaborating with uh, the uh, CyberNet project. Uh, I have one question. Uh, uh, how do you think we can best measure the impact that the EU is uh, having on SPOT in cooperation with our partners in, in third countries? Thank you. Yes, well... Any volunteers for answering? I think for the strat uh, strategy question, I, I, I would ask you to both maybe briefly comment that, maybe starting with you, Regina, I mean... Can, can you repeat briefly the question? Yeah, I mean, I understood that the question was about the EU cybersecurity strategy and the focus on capacity building there. What uh, could be done better and what could be the focus for, for the forthcoming years? I start, okay. Um... I think for capacity building, uh, we need to, um, as we were discussing already, we need to establish uh, core areas of where we prioritize our energy, because as you said, we, we cannot just uh, uh, do everything in the same, uh, in, with the same intensity everywhere. Um, we should also um, have a, um, a coordination with other regions of the world that have a similar approach, for example, with Asian, Asian uh, countries, ASEAN countries, uh, or also in Latin America, we have some partner countries that are very interested also in the European model, so we should interact closely with them. And that should be something that um, within the um, um, cyber diplomacy, cyber security strategy of the European Union in the external dimension of this communication uh, could be uh, mirrored. Anything to add from you? Yeah, Ellie. I think one, one of the prerequisites for uh, doing successful capacity building outside of the European Union would be also to make sure that uh, our internal ability to increase expertise is there. So I think what we also need to do is some sort of incubation or, or some other mechanism, train the trainers mechanism, where we are increasing the number of experts. Uh, I think we are all fighting for the same experts, whether it's the competence center, uh, which is for internal uh, purposes, or whether it's our uh, banks and our um, critical sectors here in our member states, or, or whether it's cyber commands. Um, so the, the number of experts is, is still there, which is a limited number. So I think um, uh, the European Union new uh, strategy should possibly also address the question of um, education and, mm -hmm. uh, and how the academic um, part of our uh, member states could help there to increase rapidly the expertise that we all need. 
Thanks for that. And I mean, the same to you as well, Pascal. I mean, if you, if you look at the, in the future, I mean, what exactly um, would be your expectation to the cybersecurity strategy and the priorities and perhaps also the um, EU uh, cybernet's role in that wider strategic context? Well, I definitely agree with Heli that uh, education is a key, a key element. Uh, we know that we are lacking globally cybersecurity experts uh, a lot at the moment. So that's a clear education is a clear is a clear element, um, it, and this is clearly also related to, to to cybernet. So a good knowledge about where are the experts, who they are, um, what what competences they have. That's already a very good start uh, of knowing better what is really really the gap because all the, the the studies that have been done lately about the need for for uh, experts, I would say they didn't they don't have this this knowledge yet. So it 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 can really help to fine tune more clearly what is the need and to develop in that sense specific education programs. Or training, or awareness, or all these all these elements. This is one one 